Good morning, welcome back. Um, so I guess we had a week to look at the Frege on sense and reference. So I'll take it that you've all got that and I'll and we can just move on from that. that? <laughs> you, I'm not denying that you might have done it, but um, you would be unusual. Um, these passages, as I said, are really where analytic philosophy today begins, and they are some of the most discussed passages in the whole of analytic philosophy, with thousands and thousands of pages devoted to them. So what I'm going to do today, what I'm going to do today and on Friday is just work through what Frege is doing in these first couple of pages of On Sense and Reference. Let me just pause a second until everyone gets settled. So on Friday, we'll look at pages 59 to 61, plus the top two lines of page 62. You, you get the sense that you're expected to work through this quite slowly. <laughs> <laughs> but really, that's quite a lot. Um, I understand that at UCLA, they have sometimes in the past spent the entire semester on these first few paragraphs of one sense and reference. So we are really going to be blasting through it. Um, Okay, last time, so just to give a sense of why this is so key, it, although it does seem, I, I grant you, pretty technical and a, a little bit obscure what's going on here, but last time I said the basic question about language is how does it come about that there can be such a thing as a system of signs where there are standards of right or wrong, truth or falsity for this, those sentences? How does it happen that there's such a thing as truth or falsity in the world at all? Now, that's a, a big question. And when you're um, thinking about where to start with it, a really natural, basic place to start is with the relation between a name and the thing that it names, between uh, a term like that chair and the particular chair I'm talking about, a name like Bill Clinton, and that particular man. So, if you could understand how it comes about that names refer to objects, then you'd understand something about how it is that there are standards of rightness and wrongness governing the use of statements involving names. If you can understand how that connection between the simple sign, that chair, and a particular chair is set up, then you will have made the first step to understanding how it is that a remark like that chair is yellow or that chair is blue can be true or false. The very first thing to do is to understand how the connection between a sign and a language and a bit of the world gets set up. So we want to understand how it is that the elements of a sentence can refer to objects around us, be used to say something about the world around us. And the simplest part of the problem is, how is it that words can refer to things? That's the basic problem. Okay? Are all right so far? Plain as day so far? Watch me very closely here. Okay. Now, um, Frege's uh, first move is quite an unexpected one here. He says there's a distinction we can make between informative and uninformative identity statements. So I want to spend a little while just talking about what that means, what the distinction is between an informative and an uninformative identity statement. Identity statements of the form A is identical to A. So you see what he means by an identity statement. An identity statement is one where you've got a term referring to an object, then you've got a sign of identity, is identical to, or an equal sign, or something like that. And then another sign referring to an object. If it's the same object, the thing is going to be true. If it's not the same object, the thing is going to be false. <laughs> Watch me very closely here. That's all right? Okay. Um, so if you take a remark like, that chair is that chair, that's a priori, Frege says, and according to Kant, to be labelled analytic. While identity statements of the form A is identical to B 
often contain very valuable extensions of our knowledge and cannot always be established a priori. What's a priori? A priori, you can tell that the proposition is true just by thinking about it. You don't need to look. So just by thinking about it, you can figure out that 2 plus 2 is 4. I'm sorry, you, you, there must be chairs. There's a chair over here. Um, uh, just by thinking about it, you can tell that 2 plus 2 is 4. Just by thinking about it, you can tell that um, the sum of the square of the sides of our right, or the sum of the hypotenuse of the square of our hypotenuse of a right angle triangle is equal to the sum of the squares on the other two sides. I might need to think a bit more about that, but <laughs> <laughs> the key is you do it just by thinking about it. And if you can do it just by thinking about it, you don't have to look, you don't have to actually find such a, a, a triangle. Um, then uh, uh, the thing is a priori. And it's analytic if the proposition's true in virtue of meaning. So analytic is something like um, uh, yellow is lighter than brown. Um, that is the meaning of the term. It means that yellow is lighter than brown. So Frege is saying, if you've got a statement like the morning star is the morning star, okay, class, is that a priori? Yes, can you tell that's true just by thinking about it? Very good. Is it true in virtue of the meanings of the words? Damn good. Okay. Uh, and how about the evening star is the evening star? That's a priori in analytic. Yes, that's all right. Listen, pa pause me here if that's not completely straightforward. Okay. Um, but now consider the morning star is the evening star. That star that shines so brightly in the, in the morning is the star that, uh, si the same thing as the star that shines so brightly in the evening. Is that a priori? No, that is not a priori. That is an identity statement, but it is not a priori. Um, is it analytic? Is it true just because of the meanings of the signs? No, of course not. I mean, you, the, 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 that you really have to use a telescope to find out about. Take this object here, our own dear Earth. Is that the same as that object there? Can you tell just by looking? No, you cannot. So, uh, but I promise you that identity is true. That is the Earth as seen from Saturn. Um, so that is an identity, all right, and it's a true identity, but it is... Um, Uninformed. Informative. Unif what do you think? Informative, right. Okay. Um, what about this? This building here. Um, is this building here the same as this building here? Possibly, yeah. So suppose I tell you that it actually is. I just took that shot myself. Um, if I tell you that building there is the same as that building there, uh, is that informative? Damn good. Okay, now um, the thing is, you see what's going on here intuitively is that when you look at it like this, you have one take on the building. You look at it like that, you have a different take on the building. Yeah. So what, what's making it uninformative is that you have different take on the thing, something like that. Whereas if I just say, is this building this building? It's the same take two times. So intuitively the thing is going to be uninformative. Um, I mean, this is very important in literature. Um, take uh, uh, the identity, Sir Percy Blakeney, the effete fop, the leader of English fashion, is the dashing Scarlet Pimpernel. Um, now, it's very important that that's um, informative, right? The whole story turns on it. Um, Clark Kent is Superman. Um, is that an identity statement? Yes. Is it true? Yes. Is it um, informative? Of course, everyone was completely amazed, right? <laughs> and, uh, I mean, this is not just some idle academic exercise. Take perhaps the most famous informative identity. Um, I mean, like I say, this is not some idle ivory tower thing. If George Lucas had been insensitive to the distinction between informative and uninformative identity statements, you might have had the whole sequence working up to so some revelation like, look, your father is your father. <laughs> uh, <coughs> know this, Luke Skywalker. I am myself. <laughs> and you, you see the problem? It wouldn't work at all. Um, 
Uh, so the distinction between informative and infor uninformative identities is really very important in real life. Um, here's Frege. The discovery that the rising sun is not new every morning, but always the same, was one of the most fertile astronomical discoveries. I once saw a cartoon that showed two cavemen looking at the setting sun, and one was saying, you know, there's a big pile of them over there. Um, <laughs> And that, that, that reflects a time at which it really wasn't known that the rising sun was the same every day. Right? So that is an informative thing to be told, that it's the same one every day. And a friend who used to play pinball, who had a similar thing, do you, actually probably nobody knows what pinball is. Do you, pinball? Yes. Yeah, you got a bunch of balls and you... Well, actually, the thing is, my friend always thought you got a bunch of five balls and you sent them round the thing each time. Right, but of course... You don't get five balls, you only get one ball, and it goes around five times. So, <laughs> it's just part of growing up. <laughs> there are these things you learn. <laughs> um, okay. So, is that all right for informative and uninformative identities? Yeah? That's rock solid? Yeah? So, it's uninformative because it's kind of trivial, obviously, it has to be the case. Okay. Uh, the only word I. I kind of hesitate there is, is, is because. To say it's uninformative is to say it's trivially true. That's right. You know, it's the same thing. It's, it doesn't tell, give you anything of substance. But the explanation of this phenomenon is actually quite a hard thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, earlier you said two plus three before the... A priori, yes. Uh -huh. And I don't say yes. Uh, my memory, yeah, Frege thinks that 2 plus 2 is 4 is uh, analytic, though um, he does not think it's an, an easy thing to establish that, yeah, but he does think it's analytic. I, but uh, there are lots of complexities in that example. Yeah, um, I, I don't want too much to turn on it. All I meant was, um, on the face of it, thinking about the meanings of the signs should be enough to let you know that that is true. Yeah, it shouldn't need any extra act. Uh, any special source of insight on the part of the mind, some special organ to tell you that that is true. Um, so there must be another chair somewhere. Uh, is there another chair? Okay, yeah. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, okay. Um, okay. Um, so Frege says that what this, the existence of this distinction shows is that you need... Um, to contrast, on the one hand, the sign itself, the physical shapes, the, the combination of words, the letter, whatever it is, the physical bit of language, and then there's the sense of the sign, and finally, there's what the word stands for. So if you take a term like that chair, or a name like Bill Clinton, on the one hand, you've got the name Bill Clinton, or the uh, term that chair, that's the physical bits of language. You've got the object they stand for, but you must always also have this intermediate level, the sense of the sign. Now, that contrasts to a more uh, a simpler view where you say, I don't know what this stuff about sense is. This is what he calls mode of presentation in those passages. And you might say, well, that's really pretty weird, that stuff about mode of presentation. I don't really see why we need that. Can't we do without that? Can't we just say the simple common sense thing? You've got a sign, and you've got the thing that the sign stands for, and um, that's all you need to say. Well, what's going on in those first couple of paragraphs is that Frege is arguing against this view that you only need the sign and this thing the object stands for. Because how are you going to explain that distinction between uninformative and informative identities? If you were to regard equality or identity as a relation between that which the names A and B designate, it would seem that A is identical to B could not differ from A is identical to A, if A is B is true. Is that all right? Because if what you've got is um, the same, two signs both referring to the same object and all that we're considering 
is the name and the object. Now, when you say A is B, you're talking about a relation that this object stands in to itself, namely identity. So if you say um, Sir Percy Blakeney is the Scarlet Pimpernel, then uh, you're saying just the same thing as if you said Sir Percy Blakeney is Sir Percy Blakeney. You just took the same object two times and said it's identical to itself. But that's the same thing you did on both occasions. Yeah? If you've just got the objects in the sign, then saying A is identical to B is just the same thing as saying A is identical to A. So saying the morning star is the morning star, or the morning star is the evening star, well, what's the difference between these two? And the big difference was one's informative and the other one's informative. But where is there a difference between them? There is no difference in which objects they're about. That's all right? So, you might say, well, maybe what this shows is that these statements are really about signs. These statements, the morning star is the morning star, or the morning star is the evening star, they're really statements about language. What these statements are saying is, the sign, the morning star, stands for the same thing as does the sign, the evening star. Or the sign, the morning star, stands for the same thing as does the sign, the morning star. And you may say, well, we're really talking about language here. This is Frege uh, expressing this view. He says, what is intended to be said by A is identical to B seems to be, this is not his view, this is the sign he's going to, the view he's going to attack. He says, what is say, being said by that seems to be that the signs or the names A and B designate the same things. So those signs themselves are under discussion. Identity looks like it's a relation between objects. When you say one object is identical uh, to um, an, another object, then what you're saying is something about the objects, but that's not what's happening. Um, you're really talking about the signs. And then Frege's point is that relation between the names or the signs a is referring to the same thing as B is referring to. That would hold between um, the names or signs only in so far as they designated something. It would be mediated by the connection of each of the two signs with the same designated thing. But this is arbitrary. That's to say, if you're saying... Um, Sir Percy Blakeney is the Scarlet Pimpernel, then you seem to be talking about a fact. If you say the, um, the morning star is the evening star, or the rising sun is the same every morning, that seems to be a fact about the world out there. But if you're talking about the connection of a name to a sign, that's just an arbitrary uh, fact about language. Any sign could have referred to something else. But when you talk about the rising sun being the same every morning, that doesn't seem to have anything to do with the arbitrary conventions of language. Nobody can be per forbidden to use any arbitrarily producible event or object as a sign for something. Um, so you can use anything as a sign for anything, right? I can say, let's have this coffee cup stand for the Republican Party. Well, why not? Uh, you can do that. I can say, let's have this um, remote stand as a sign for the Republican Party. And then there you go, I get an identity here. Um, <laughs> um, uh, but that's just a fact about the, 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 these arbitrary things, uh, assignations of reference I just gave to things. So if you said the identity is just talking about what, the two signs, the sentence A is identical to B would no longer refer to the subject matter, but only to its mode of designation. We would express, he says, no proper knowledge by its means. So that's his first point. By proper knowledge, he means knowledge about something out there independent of language, like the rising sun being the same every morning. The rising sun would be the same every morning, 
even if language had never existed, even if humans had never existed, there would still be the same rising sun every morning. That's what he means, proper knowledge. By knowledge that's not proper, he means knowledge about the arbitrary conventions of language. And this position is turning, it is identical to be, into some knowledge about the arbitrary conventions of language. And he's saying, well, look, anyway, um, I suppose you think of the information that the sign, the morning star here, refers to the same thing as does the sign, the morning star over here. Is that informative or not? If I tell you that the sign, the morning star, let's just, get, suppose you take that thing at the top and you interpret that as meaning this sign is referring to the same thing as that sign. Is that informative or not? It is informative. Who said that? Yeah, that's correct. I mean, um, because after all, you could perfectly... Well, do you want to explain that a bit more? Yeah, there are two things. There's which sign, there's which object each is referring to. Yeah, and that's going to be informative. And there's that they're referring to the same object. And that's going to be informative too. Because after all, you could have a language, and in fact our language sometimes works like this, where when you use the same name on two consecutive occasions, uh, <laughs> when you use the same name on two consecutive occasions, um, they actually always refer to different things. Um, one of my colleagues has... Uh, uh, his mother has um, two physicians, both called Dr. Jones, who sometimes talk to each other, and she reports their discussions. So um, he, he gets a bit confused, and he says, wait a minute, so Dr. Jones said that to Dr. Jones? But what did Dr. Jones say to that? Um, and when you talk like that, you would only talk like that if there were really two Dr. Joneses there. Right? If I say to you, so Bill said to Bill, then you just assume there are two different Bills there. You, you, you see what I mean? Um, if Bill said to himself, that, that's, that's a different thing. You, you, you see what I mean? So sometimes we do talk in a way that requires that when you have the same sign being used twice, it's got to be a different object that's being referred to. So the mere fact that you have the same sign being used here and used here does not guarantee you it's the same object. So it's going to be informative to be told that um, the morning star is the morning star. If what that saying is, this sign refers to the same thing as that sign, that would be informative. And it would just carry about the same amount of information as the morning star is the evening star. So that's his point. Here, the cognitive value of A is identical to A becomes essentially equal to that of A is identical to B, if A is identical to B is true. So what we were trying to do was work with this analysis where you've just got the sign and the reference of the sign. But if you want, try to work with that, first of all you say, well, A is identical to B, A is identical to A, these are just two remarks about the references. But then it turns out they're saying just the same thing. And then you say, well, no, maybe that's about the signs, but then it turns out they're both informative. So that can't be right either. So Frege says, that difference between the morning star is the morning star, and the morning star is the evening star, that can arise only if the difference corresponds to a difference in the mode of presentation of that which is designated. There's got to be some difference between the morning star is giving you one take on this object. The evening star, the sign the evening star is giving you another take on the object. And the object you get this take on is the same as the object you get that take on. That's how it turns out that this can be informative. Whereas if you get the same take two times, then it's going to be obvious that it's the same object. That's the idea, mode of presentation, the way the thing is presented to you. Yes, so if you remember that thing about the, the shed, 
that the way that shed is presented to you, if you're presented with the same shed twice, then it's obvious it's the same thing. If you're presented with it in different ways, it's not obvious it's the same thing. That's what he's saying. The distinction is... So you've got the sign, you've got the way the sign presents the object, and you've got the reference of the sign. We need those three components if we're going to explain the distinction between informative and uninformative identities. That's what he's doing in just that first couple of paragraphs. Okay, yeah. When you said the morning star is the morning star, isn't that giving the same date on the same object, and so therefore it wouldn't be obvious that they were different? I don't know, you were just saying if you have one take on something and another take on something. Yes. That's right. But, but if you give the same take on it, the morning star is the morning star, then it becomes obvious that it is the same That's right. That was my idea. Okay. Is it, uh, yeah. I, I think that's what Frege is saying. So if, you got, if you've got a sign, um, N is identical to M, and if N gives you the same take on the object as M does, then that's going to be uninformative. And if N gives you a different take on the object than M does, then it's going to be informative. Uh, if, oh, um, uh, yes, but uh, uh, only, <laughs> this is what I mean about watch, follow me very closely. Um, <laughs> but, um, so here Frege is talking about um, the idea that you, he's saying, consider a view on which you don't have this notion of sense. Yeah? Suppose you try to work without the notion of the take, then what are you going to say about these um, identity statements that are informative or uninformative? The best you can do, if you don't have that notion of the take, this is bringing out why you need the notion of your take on the object, your way of being given it, how it's presented, yeah. um, your perspective on the thing, something like that. Um, uh, if you try to work without it, the best you can do is say something like, this statement is talking about the relation between this bit of language and that bit of language. But once you frame it like that, it's going to come out to be un, uh, informative, which is the wrong answer. Yeah. So you, you're right, I did say that, but that was in the context of discussing this view, which is the wrong view. Yeah. At least that's what I think. That's what Frege thinks. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Okay, but remember that, that thing I was saying about so Dr. Jones said to Dr. Jones? Yes. The signs are written exactly the same. Okay. I mean, it's true that if you're in that kind of... Um, in that case, the reference is different. In this case, the reference is still the same. That's right, but that's just an accident. You can't, what I mean is you can't tell that just by hearing the signs. Yeah? I mean, after all, our convention of language could be... But whenever... It, I mean, you, I'm not saying it would be all that sensible, but you could set up a language where... Um, the first time you use the term the morning star, you're talking about the sun. The second time you use, in, the, in the conversation you use the term the morning star, you're talking about the Venus. The third time you use the morning star, you're talking about um, Alpha Centauri. Yeah? You could set up a language like that. You know, you could set up a code like that. Why not? I mean, that, 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 um, that's what Frege means. Um, uh, what's it called? Uh, <laughs> um, um, Nobody can be forbidden to use any arbitrarily uh, producible object or event as a sign for something. I mean, I'll talk whatever way I like. Yeah. Um, you know, you might say, well, you've got to use them to stand for the same thing. Well, I don't got to use them to stand for the same thing. You, you see what I mean? So it's going to be informative if I, uh, if I make a statement saying, well, I do use them to stand for the same thing. Yeah? Okay. Someone else? As I interpret him anyway, it's just the same thing. Yeah, that's, the, <laughs> that's an uninformative identity. Um, <laughs> the mode of designation, mode of presentation, it's the same thing. Yeah. Okay, okay so it's all up plain as day now? Yep. Yeah. Uh, 
So in informative identity, it's supposed to be something that gives you information that cannot be known a priori, is that? Uh, that's right. It can't be known a priori if it's an in, if it's an informative identity. That's what he says. Yeah. <coughs> there are complexities there, um, uh, but but, uh, but that's what he says. Yeah. And you see why he says that too. You get the same take on the object, not just the same sign, but the same take on the object. Then it's going to be obvious it's the same thing. That's the idea. So in contrast to that thing we were just talking about, where you just say, I just got the bit of language, the same bit of language being used twice, then it really is informative to be told. You're, you're using that to stand for the same thing two times. But if, as in the case of the shed, you've got the same way of being given the thing two times, that's going to be uninformative. Yep? So then, then in the case that's going to be a priori. Yeah. Like this, this picture? Yep. Um, You could, but then you'd have a different sense associated with the sign, the morning star, the first time it's used, and the second time it's used. If I, if, I, if I understand you, what you're saying is, you could have a language where the first time you use the sign, the morning star, you've got a different sense associated with it than you have when you use the sign the second time. Yeah, so it would be two different senses, and that would be informative. right? But if you use the sign in the same sense, both times, having the same sense both times, then it's uninformative that it's referring to the same thing. How about that? Well, I guess I just don't see like, exactly what the difference is between this case and the, and the other case. Like, why, uh, why, so, is it informative? why is it informative in the one case and uninformative in, in the other case? Okay. Well, the, the idea is, if I say... Listen up, class, that cup is that cup. The, 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 the idea is you didn't... <laughs> I mean, you, you will learn some wonderful things in this class, but that wasn't one of them. <laughs> and if I just say this cup is this cup, yeah, because I'm pointing to just the same thing in just the same way both times. Yeah. So the idea is that's uninformative. Yeah. It couldn't but be the same thing I got both times. Yeah. That, that was the idea. So what about that? That's not, that can't be informative. Right. I used the same bit of language both times, but there was more to it than that. The way I got the thing onto your radar was exactly the same way both times. And then it was uninformative. Okay, okay. Okay. Um, this is really basic, so I, I mean, what I mean is really basic for everything else we'll do, so it's important to uh, get all this completely clear. Okay, one, l let me just go over a little bit why this matters so much. Um, we want to understand how it is that the elements of a sentence can refer to the objects around us. How do words get hooked up to objects? In a way, that's that is the problem of language. That's the basic puzzle. Uh, over here, there's a system of signs. Over there, there is the world. How do the two get connected? What I was saying last time is, you can't really explain how the two get connected by appealing to the mind. That's anyone's first reaction to that puzzle, to say there's a language over there, there's the world over here. It's the mind that connects the language to the world. And what I was uh, arguing last time was, it can't be right to think of it like that, that it's the mind that connects them up, because there is also the puzzle how the mind gets connected to the world. The mind is not some magical thing that can just do anything it likes. The mind only has the representational abilities it has because the mind has a language. It's because we've got a human language that we can talk about and think about the things in the world. So that, there's that really basic puzzle, how do the signs get connected to the things? And Frege's answer is going to be, it's this sense that connects the signs to the objects. So if I've explained it correctly so far, he has a really um, is powerful, I mean, it's a very, when you get it, it's really a very simple argument and a very forceful argument that there must be such a thing as sense. 
And it's going to happen that that sense is what connects the system of signs to the world around us. When you say, well, I mean, just to explain why this is so basic, if you say, what does it mean to say that the sign, the morning star, is standing for a particular object? What does it mean to say that there's that connect between the sign and the thing? Well, what it means is, if you've got any sentence, the morning star shines brightly, the morning star um, twinkles, the morning star um, has a spectrum shift, uh, any statement like that, whether the, that statement is true is going to depend on whether the predicate shines brightly or twinkles or has a spectrum shift. It will depend on whether the statement is true will depend on whether that predicate is true of that object. So here I've got the sign, the morning star. Here I've got the thing, the morning star. And if I say in the language, um, the morning star shines brightly, whether that's true over here depends on whether the predicate shines brightly applies to that object. So whether the, sign, whether the predicate applies to this object um, is what determines whether the sentence over here is true. So that connection between the name and the object is basic for um, sentences being true or false. The basic puzzle is how does the name get tied up to the particular object? Well, what is sense? What do we have in sense so far? What we've got in sense so far is, is the mode of presentation of the object, the perspective from which you're getting the thing. These are not terribly explicit so far. And you, it's a natural question, well, what does that mean? What, what, what have I got on that? But whatever it is, sense has got to be what explains informativeness. If you get the same sense, you get something uninformative. If you get a different sense, you got something informative. It follows from that, actually, when you think about it, the sense has to fix the reference of the sign. If you just take this slowly, you will see that the sense has to be uniquely determining what the reference of the sign is. Because if I've got uh, a sentence A is identical to A2, and then I've got the sameness of sense for A and A2. Sameness of sense is going to make the identity uninformative. Therefore, sameness of sense must guarantee that the two signs have the same reference. Excuse me if it's me making that noise. <laughs> I think it must be. Okay. Um, but you see this argument here? That what we've, got, what we've done so far is really minimal. We've just got this distinction between informative and uninformative identities. We said to explain that, you must have this level of sense. And wherever that level of sense is, that's what's hooking up your sign to the world. We've got that already from these very simple kind of rock solid points. Sense is what's hooking up the sign to the world. Sense is explaining how the name gets tied up to the object. That's why it's so important. And we've got to fix on it by that distinction between informative and uninformative identities. So sense is going to explain how it's coming about, that there's that connection between the sign and the object, so that the truth or falsity of sentences involving the name will depend on how things are with our object. Sense is going to be the key to understanding how you can have a language in which sentences are right or wrong. Here's Frege summing things up. The regular connection between a sign, its sense, and its reference is of such a kind that to the sign there corresponds a definite sense, and to that in turn a definite reference, while to a given object there does not belong only a single sign. Okay, so just uh, when you've got a sign, you hook it up to a sense, and the sense uniquely fixes the reference. But Frigg is saying here there's no backward path from the reference to the sense. Um, you see what he's saying there? To a given object that does not be belong only a single sign. 
Is he really saying that? Yeah. I mean, the point here is eloquently illustrated by the story of Rumpelstiltskin. Uh, how are we in the story of Rumpelstiltskin? Okay, so I, I would say that's a mixed reaction. So, um, um, the Miller had a beautiful daughter. Um, the Miller told the king, my daughter can spin, spin straw into gold. And uh, the king said, um, that's great, let's see her do it. And uh, the daughter was in despair, faced with all these bales of hay, and um, said, uh, what shall I do? Or woe is me. Uh, and then this imp appeared and said, I'll help you. Give me your ring and I will spin the straw into gold. Um, and the next night, she gave the king the gold. And the king said, that's fantastic. Do it again. Here's more straw. And um, again, she said, what shall I do? And again, the imp appeared. And he said, give me um, your cloak. And she gave him her cloak. And he uh, span the straw into gold for her. And the next night, the king, king said, look, here's a ton of hay. Do it just one more time. And the imp said, well, I'll do it, but you have to give me your firstborn child. And she said, firstborn child, not a problem. Um, <laughs> uh, just give me the gold. And so he span it into gold. And the king was so impressed that he married the miller's beautiful daughter. And in due course, they had a child, upon which um, the imp appeared and uh, asked for the firstborn child. And at that point, she said, well, actually, I was only joking. And <laughs> he was extremely indignant and said, um, you have to give me it. But after some discussion, uh, he said, OK, I'll tell you what. Um, you can keep the child if you can guess my name. And she said, well, is it, is it Bill? Is it Simon? And he said, no. And she walked through, illustrating Frege's point. There is no backward path from the object to the sign. Right? <laughs> The rest of the story is of no philosophical interest, so we'll leave it at that. <laughs> okay. So you see what he means? To a given object, there must not belong only a single sign. Okay. Okay? Okay. Um, let me just make... Uh, this is just a slightly technical thing, but I think it affects how you think about... Um, uninformativeness. Uh, consider this kind of inference. The morning star is F, the, morning, the evening star is G, hence the morning star is both F and G. Okay, what do you think, class? Is that inference valid, or in A, invalid, or B, valid? That is the right answer. That is not a valid inference. Right? You need an extra premise. You need to say the morning star is the evening star, and then it would work, right? Consider in contrast, the morning star is F, the morning star is G, hence the morning star is both F and G. Is that valid or invalid? Valid, that's fine just the way it is, right? Now, look at that. I've got one inference here that's valid, and one inference here that's invalid. Valid. Invalid, valid, invalid. But look, what's going on is um, all that's happened between this one and this one is that I swapped out one sign referring to an object with another sign also referring to the same object. Yeah, and that's making a difference to whether the thing is valid or not. You, you know, yeah. Yeah. Right. Very good. Very good. So your point is, you could have an inference of loops just like this. Dr. Jones is F. Dr. Jones is G. 
Um, but it wouldn't be valid. Excellent. So saying this a sign is not what's making this valid. Yeah? Uh, and really, difference of sign is not the key thing making this invalid. After all, you could say, Dr. Jones is F, Dr. Simon Jones is G. And if it's just the same guy you have in mind, that's fine. Yeah? So, sameness or difference of sign is not the key thing for the validity or invalidity of the inference. What is the name for the thing that is making a difference to the validity or invalidity? It can't be the reference, right? And your point is it's not the sign. The sense, right? <laughs> okay. So this, uh, you, you, your point is absolutely dead on. It must be something like the sense. Yep. Yeah. Carry on. That is a good question. Yeah. All we've said so far, uh, I mean, we're not making any conjectures here, right? All we're doing so, I mean, this is why this stuff is important, is because there seems to be so little element of guesswork or speculation. This is just rock solid things about the distinction between an informative and an uninformative identity. And we just brought sense in there. Yeah? So we're not answering that question yet. How does the sense get associated with the sign? Um, but you're right, that's a really important question. Um, and we will go on to it. I mean, I'm not <laughs> flopping you off. We will discuss that in a great deal of detail. I think. Yeah. Um, OK. Um, so uh, if you consider these inferences, the morning star is F, the evening star is G, the morning star is F, the morning star is G, that difference, boom, boom, boom. Look at that. Right. Now, what, <laughs> what's going on there as you switch from valid to invalid and back again is um, uh, just that the sense is shifting. So sense matters for validity. And this really matters. I mean, when you just put it in terms of informative versus uninformative identities, um, despite what I said about the importance in movies and literature, that might really seem not that key. But this kind of inferential behavior, that's really critical to um, ordinary talk about people or places at all. When you think about your talk about someone you know, talking about a friend of yours, gossiping about a friend of yours, um, talking about Mitt Romney, talking about um, um, anyone at all, what you've got to be able to do is put all the information you have of that person all together. You're always collecting the information you have about people or things into a single cluster. Yeah. And that ability to do that without any extra premises, that's really basic to any use of names um, or signs referring to objects at all. So we need, if we need the notion of sense here, then the notion of sense is absolutely basic to our understanding of proper names. Okay. And so what validity is demanding there is sameness of sense. Okay, we will carry on looking at these paragraphs on Friday. Thanks very much.